Greetings, fellow scientists. My name is Karina, and I am a member of the Saskatchewan Science Center's Go Science Outreach Team. Today, we're going to be crushing out some science about canola and how we get oil from these teeny tiny seeds. First, a little bit of background on this crop. Canola was developed by many teams in Canada who all saw the potential of a different seed and wanted to make it even better than it already was. This would mean adapting it to make the seed better able to grow in Canadian prairie soil, as well as developing products the seed could produce, like oil. This required decades of research and testing, and finally, we arrived at the canola seed. But this seed is still so small. Believe it or not, about 40% of the seed is oil, and the other 60% is what we call canola meal which humans can't eat. But if humans can't eat it, does that mean we throw it away? No way. Canola meal is used in many kinds of feed for different animals, including pigs, chickens, and even cat and dog food. Just because humans can't eat something doesn't mean that animals won't be able to. Because of this, the entire canola seed is zero waste. So, now we know what we do with this hard outer layer, but where's the oil? Well, to get to the oil, we have to crush the seed. This is a process that is normally done in a big canola crushing plant, but today we're going to be hand crushing seeds. This is a canola grade test strip. Farmers in Saskatchewan would use this a little bit differently than how we're using it today. Normally, Farmers would use this to roll out seeds, not to look for oil, but to check the insides of the seed and their color. Yellow seeds are mature and ready for harvest, whereas green seeds are typically premature or have been hit by frost. What we've done here is taken some seeds from the test strip and placed it on this strip of paper. When we crush the seeds, which you'll be able to hear, the oil will be released from the seeds and onto the paper. Wow, did you hear that popping? That was the sound of the seed popping open and oil being released. Let's check it out. Do you see the spots on the paper that are darker? That's the oil that was released from the seeds. We just made canola oil. Now think about how much canola it must take to fill a whole container of oil. Remember, if you ate today, thank a farmer. Now, if we were going to check the grade of this canola, all we need to do is peel back this paper and look at the colors of the crushed seeds. There are 100 seeds in a test strip, which makes doing the math really easy in predicting what the rest of the field might look like. That being said, Farming can be very unpredictable, and it wouldn't be absurd to hear of a farmer who has half a field of canola that was impacted by frost and the other half be completely fine. Weather can be weird, and farmers constantly have to adapt to it. This canola looks good enough to eat, but I think I'll wait until after it goes through the process at a plant instead. We hope you enjoyed this fantastic farming demonstration with us today. You can also check out other neat experiments by visiting us online at sasksciencecenter.com. Until next time, stay curious, fellow scientists. Hey, how you doing? Tommy Tungsten here for Elements R Us with another super special sale. Today's deal is a real powerhouse, folks. Uranium. That's right. Now you too can have the power of nuclear fission at your fingertips provided you pass a mandatory scientific background check and complete a 365-day waiting period. Why all this fuss? Well, I don't want to bore you with all the details, but our uranium is brought to you by some very intrepid folks from Saskatchewan who go to all the trouble of mining up ore with small amounts of uranium in it, grinding it up, doing all sorts of razzle-dazzle chemistry, and turning it into something called a yellow cake, which is most certainly not edible. They then transport them cakes to other places where they do a bunch more chemistry 
to enrich the uranium so it can be used as fuel. On top of all that, uranium is a radioactive element, which is the reason why it's useful as a source of power, but also the reason why it's very dangerous to work with unless you're very smart and know how to handle the stuff. It's a lot of effort, but a single 7 gram pellet of uranium fuel the size of my fingertip can contain as much energy as 3.5 barrels of oil, or nearly a ton of coal. With power like that, you are not going to want to miss out on this deal. So get on down to Elements R Us and enrich yourself with some uranium before this deal decays away. And when you get there, tell them Tommy sent you, capiche? Hello everyone, my name is Sally Science and I love it when you send in your curious questions for us to explore together. And today we have a scaly question from my friend Cohen. Are toads, frogs, and salamanders reptiles? Thanks so much Cohen for sending in this great question. I was just wondering this the other day. The short answer, Cohen, is that toads and frogs and salamanders are all called amphibians and are not reptiles. Although scientists did think that they were the same for a long time because they had many similarities. But they also have many differences. And the ways in which reptiles and amphibians are different really makes the difference. Ha! Get it? In order to help biologists sort through the countless number of animal species on Earth, they have organized them into five classes. Mammals, birds, fish, reptiles, and amphibians. When biologists want to figure out which class an animal belongs in, they use their powers of observation and ask questions like, how does it have families? Or how does it stay warm? Or what is covering the outside of its body? And how does it breathe? So friends, let's be biologists and compare amphibians and reptiles. Firstly, let's look at their skin. Reptiles have scales all over their body and amphibians have smooth, wet skin. Fun fact! Amphibians can actually exchange gases through that smooth, wet skin, meaning they can actually breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide through their skin. How amazing is that? Amphibians can also breathe under the water through their gills just like fish do. And this is really super useful because most amphibians live in or near bodies of water. Reptiles cannot breathe through their skin. They breathe through their lungs just like you and me. And most reptiles live on land, but some like crocodiles can live in the water too, but they still have to come out of the water to catch their breath. Both amphibians and reptiles lay eggs, but the eggs couldn't be more different from each other. Reptiles lay eggs on land and they have a leathery, flexible shell. Not like those hard shells on the eggs you eat for breakfast. Ha! And when reptile babies or hatchlings break out of their eggs, they look like smaller versions of their parents. Amphibians lay eggs covered in a jelly. Not like a jelly you put on your toast though. This jelly-like substance helps keep the eggs safe and gives them a snack for when they're born. And when the amphibian babies hatch, they are called tadpoles or efts. And they don't look anything like their parents. They kind of look squiggly with just a big head and a tail. What? Amphibians do something super cool. They go through a process called metamorphosis as they grow up. 
and metamorphosis basically means to change from one shape to another as you get older. So before a frog looks like a frog, it starts as an egg, then becomes a squiggly thing called a tadpole, and then starts to grow legs and lose its tail and eventually changing shape into a frog. How cool is that? Fun fact, amphibians and reptiles are both what scientists call ectothermic. And that means they are cold blooded. Ha, that doesn't mean that their blood is actually cold. It means that they cannot produce their own body heat like you and me. They have to sit in a sunbeam and absorb the heat from the sun to warm up. Another fun fact, frogs and toads are both amphibians, but frogs prefer to hop because they have longer legs and toads prefer to walk because their legs are shorter. Pretty neat, hey? I hope y'all had a fun being biologists with me today, friends. And thanks again, Cohen, for sending in this awesome question. If you have a question that you'd like to explore with me, please send it in. I would love to hear it. Take care, everyone, and I hope you have a happy day. <laughs> Good one, Sally. And this is Sally Science, signing off. <laughs>